Hey, today on the show, we are chatting with Elliot Hoyt from Amherst Madison Real Estate Advisors. Let me tell you a little bit about Elliot. Elliot is originally from England and moved to Boise to attend college. Uh, his passion for the community, commitment to helping others, competitive spirit, and dream of owning his own business led him to a career in real estate. Elliot is a graduate of Boise State University, where he excelled in the classroom and earned a degree in organizational and relational communication. Elliot also made a name for himself on the football field as a championship winning defensive lineman. He attributes much of his work ethic and results driven business to his athletic endeavors. He is uh, the most recent member of the National Association of Realtors 2020 30 under 30 class, which is a massive, massive uh, achievement. I think there are 1.6 million realtors or something to that effect in the United States. Um, and so to be in that uh, 30 under 30 is, is a huge deal. Um, you can also visit Elliot at his website, elliothoyt.com. That's E-L-L-I-O-T-H-O-Y-T-E.com. And please follow Elliot on Instagram. You can find him at, at Elliot, E-L-L-O-I-T underscore Hoyt, H-O-Y-T-E. Elliot, welcome to our show. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. You're our very first Idaho uh, guest, so we're excited to, uh, to so what, what, how are things, are, are you guys able to practice, before we get into uh, you and yeah. your history, how does it, is Idaho open for real estate right now? Yeah, we are, we're deemed essential. Um, obviously, there's some parameters uh, we have to work in for safety of clients and homeowners and such. Um, we can't do any open houses right now. Uh, and then there's precautions we have to take when showing houses. But luckily, for the most part, while it's affected us, it's, we can still do a lot of the stuff we could do before. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. We're, we're the same way in Illinois, um, but just to the north of us, Michigan's pretty much closed. And uh, New York, I know, is closed. And a lot of, lot of states, uh, on our, our brokers yeah. are unable to, to work. So uh, glad to hear that you're able to, to practice. But um, tell us, I, I would love to hear about your story. Of first, of course, you know, I'm growing up in, in the UK and, and coming here. Um, but can you share, how did you get in, involved in real estate? So... Um... Skipping the, the, the long story of how I actually got here, um, I, I used to be a, a brand ambassador for Porsche and also for Mercedes-Benz at um, a local dealership. And um, I was at, actually at an event for the dealership at a local restaurant. Um, and I ran into the CEO of my now brokerage, um, Nick Schleckler at Amherst Madison, who was also a Boise State football player uh, oh, wow. eight years before me. Yeah, I bumped into him at, at, this, at this bar, at this restaurant. And we knew each other from before. He said, hey, you know, how's it going? I said, good. Do, do, do. I told him what was going on. He told me what was going on with him. He's like, you ever thought about selling real estate? And I was like, I mean, I'd always thought about it because it kind of like a pretty cool career. But, uh, I don't know if that's like, you seem, you have to be quite well qualified. I was thinking, not little do I know after being a real estate agent, you don't actually have to too much qualifications. Uh, but long story short, he kind of, kind of coerced me into it. Uh, and a week later, I'd ended up quitting my job and, and got my license and, and went to work. So yeah, it's kind of Nick. Nick, who I have to blame for this lifestyle I now lead. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually want to go back, for, and I, I apologize. I, I really am curious to know about about your football career as well. So before, before uh, even getting into real estate, um, how did you how did did you grow up playing football, or how did you get involved? So my dad, funny story actually. My dad's English, um, but he actually went to um, Harper Rainey in Illinois. Um, near you actually in Chicago at junior yeah. college he played football in America for two years um, for Harper Rainey then played for the University of Akron um, in Ohio sure. and then played in the World League which is the first year of American football in Europe um, so that's kind of my background but I played rugby my whole life and basically I was begging my dad to play back home club football and up until the age of 16 and he finally was like yeah let's let's find a place and I had to travel two hours to play football because there was no local team yeah so sure. I had to play I had to travel to play club football and um yeah, that's how I got into football. I went to um, a cat, Boise State's uh, summer camp my senior year because I had, a, I had a mutual friend through rugby who actually ended up playing at Boise State years on. And yeah, it's kind of through that connection. They offered me a scholarship on like, the second day of camp. And I was like, wow. hey, you know what? I got nothing to do for the next five years. So let's go play football and get a scholarship. So yeah, wow. <laughs> that's kind of how I ended up here. So. That's amazing. And, and, and you've stayed and, and uh, now are yep. building a nice career for yourself in, in real estate, which is, uh, which is awesome. I'm um, trying. <laughs> well, let's 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 talk about that because I know or I assume and this is probably a, a reasonable assumption but you'll you'll have to tell me um, how the the discipline needed to perform at the collegiate level uh, in athletics in any sport 
obviously is takes a tremendous amount of effort, discipline, uh, dedication. Uh, I'm wondering how closely that parallels what you see as, as the secrets to your success thus far in real estate. I think there's a, there's a definite translation. Obviously you go from doing something that's very, very physical. And I guess some would say somewhat dangerous to something that's physically for the most part passive. But the biggest thing that I carry over from football that taught me was just what you said was discipline. Um, you have certain habits as an athlete that you have to, you know, you have schedules and you have habits that you go through and accountability. And, and that translates to this day. I mean, even with what's going on with this pandemic, I still come to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five, sometimes seven, eight a.m to get my day started because it's all muscle memory. Like I wake up and I do it without me thinking. Yeah, like sometimes I don't even have anything yeah. on the schedule. I don't know about you. I just, I just wake up and I come to the office because that, mm -hmm. that to me, this is my, this is now my practice field in a way, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a massive translation. Just that discipline I had with football and accountability makes yourself accountable in your career too. So. And how many, how many years are, are you in now uh, for into real estate? This is my second year. So first house I actually sold, was March of 2019. So yeah, I'm only, I'm only just into my second year of, yeah, it's kind of, kind of crazy. So yeah, in fact, I'd love to talk about, you know, because you're so new and at the same time you have earned, um, you know, quite a reputation, at least, uh, not just locally and not just in the state of Idaho either, but nationally you you've been awarded this 30 under 30. We've had a, a number of other 30 under 30 winners on, um, and, and there were so, uh, sort of occurred to us. We've been doing this four years and we saw that the, the list had come out about a month or so ago and, and we went, Oh, let's, let's start talking to some of these, these up and comers because, uh, really, you know, it's funny. I, I, you guys are at this interesting stage where you're at the beginning. Most of you are at the beginning of your career and yet you're having this tremendous, tremendous success. So, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, okay, you got your license, you, 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 your, your former friend and, and now is who, who owns the firm convinced you to, to get into real estate. Um, you know, being that you're, you didn't grow up there, although you did attend school, um, how did you start to grow your business? I imagine the sphere of influence probably wasn't that great. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but tell us about how, how you did get started. So luckily, I, luckily I, I, I was, um, I guess to start with the sphere thing, sphere thing, sorry. Um, I, I did quite a good job in college and networking. Um, and that, and I mean, outside of athletics. So I did a lot of community service stuff. I would network when I could with local businesses and people of, of, of that nature. So I kind of organically grew this sphere without even realizing it. People that just, you know, liked me because I was a football player and I actually turned out to be a half decent friend, I guess, in the end. Sure. Um, and then the biggest thing, believe it or not, was my job um, at Lyle Pearson working for the uh, Porsche Mercedes brands. I had a lot of clients um, through that, obviously, that kind of knew and knew, liked and trusted me. And as any real estate agent will tell you, if you're known, liked, and trusted by someone, it's yeah. a lot easier to do business. So yeah, really, really a lot of my clients have come from both my time at Boise State networking and then um, from my old job to some extent too. Um, the first, the first, I, got, I actually got my license in June of 2018. I didn't sell anything for seven months. And yeah. Was, and, and by the that, way, that's, that's not an uncommon story. So we've done about 160 yeah. of these episodes and it is not uncommon. Uh, although certainly not a comfortable time for anybody when they're starting out, if they don't sell a home for seven months. Um, but, uh, but, but not uncommon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I was, I think I've grown up a lot in the last 18 months, even. <laughs> um, I, I thought getting into this, I probably had about three, maybe four months of financial reserves. Um, and I, I, I was very arrogant. I think in the sense I was like, Oh, you know what? I played football. I won't even football. need it. I won't yeah, have to touch it. I'll be doing, I'll be doing million dollar deals next week. I was thinking to myself, yeah, three or four months, that'd be enough. I'll sell a couple million dollar houses next week and I'll be fine. And I'll tell you the reason why I thought that one of the guys who was actually my mentor, his name's Matt Bauscher. Um, and he's at our brokerage here. He's um, a co-founder um, of the brokerage. He, is one of the top producers in the entire state. He's number one, two or three every year. Yeah. When I got into the business and I was, I was kind of mirroring Matt um, and kind of learning from him for the first couple of weeks. And this guy's slinging out, I mean, I'm not kidding, million dollar properties, closing on them every other day in some instances. Yeah. I'm thinking that's normal, but Matt's been right. years building a business up. Sure. So yeah, in my head, I came in arrogant, like, yeah, it's fine. I'm going to get this done. And I was humbled very fast. Um, I was actually humbled to the point where I was down to about $17 in my bank account, I was driving Uber for two or three months to pay my, my dues just to get through to the next year. And that was probably 
it was the, one of the worst times in my life, but it built so much character and it sling that, that toughness that it kind of built in me sling shot me to where I'm at right now, I think. So. Well, and now, you know, it, it, and thank you for that story. And now you know that even if it all goes away tomorrow, which it isn't going to happen, that isn't going to happen. But if it is, you already now have an actual experience of being down to almost, you know, no, no income, uh, n- no reserves and, and you and look where you are now. So I think just even that experience alone is like, oh, there's a little bit of uh, relief there in case anything changes right now. Obviously, the whole world has changed, at least temporarily, uh, and, and probably in some cases permanently as far as how we do business. Um, but to, to now know that you know how to pivot and how to rebuild uh, is, is obviously an amazing um, skill to, to have cultivated. I know you didn't intend to cultivate. It wasn't by choice. <laughs> it wasn't by choice, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, honestly, like it's, it's a good thing to, because now for the rest of your life, you'll just, you'll just know, well, if it all just goes away tomorrow, I can do, I'll rebuild. And um, that's, yeah. that's a remarkable thing, especially for someone as, as young as yourself. Um, but so, so I have another question about Uber because um, obviously you were, I, mean, I, I don't know that we've had anyone on our show who's, who's been driving uh, at any point for them. So I'm curious, did it ever happen where while you were um, driving that anyone ever became a client? I've always thought, I don't know what the rules are with Uber. Maybe they don't really want you mentioning stuff. Like I, I, can't, I can't remember. They may not want me mentioning, but hey, the, <laughs> I'd rather, rather ask for forgiveness and permission. Um, yeah, I, had yeah. a, I had a couple, I had a, I've had a few people I, that I, I met, one guy that might be a client one day, Funny enough, I actually met my my chosen home inspector. Believe it or not, I met him Ubering, um, awesome. and he's done he's probably done thirty plus, maybe more home inspections for me in the last year. Um, so I guess that's kind of a funny story that way. Um, and yeah, I just a lot of it's confidence too. Like I I I kind of pretended that I didn't need to be doing Uber because sure. mentally for me, I was like, hey, in my head, I know I need to be doing this, but if I tell him I'm an agent and I just do it to networking then they'll yeah. probably believe it. I might get some leads. Nothing's mature because kind of come from it yet, but I don't know, maybe one day someone will turn around and say, you to me, you know? So, so, so how did you end up, um, you know, starting to build your business? So you, the first six or seven months you said were, were pretty slim. What were you doing during that time? And, and was it just a delayed payoff? Like you were, you were doing the activities correctly and it just didn't hit as quickly as you wanted, or was it, did it take a while to figure out what to do to build your business? It was a little bit of both. So my first, uh, my two first closings came from my very first open house in August, which is crazy. So first open house in August, close on those clients in March. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, it was it was from doing open houses that really helped. And then having a really good follow-up system. So these clients, these people that I met in my very first open house, I had a very meticulous plan for following up with them. And it wasn't necessarily like, hey, let's go look at houses. It was just being present in front of them. And I do that with anyone I come into contact with. If I can bring value to them and stay in contact, it comes back around. I mean, I learned very quickly with real estate. Um, there's no such thing really as a deal tomorrow. Everything has yeah. to, there's like a cultivation process. And that's, yeah, I guess that's what it is. I just kind of stuck to a system and it, the floodgates opened about six, seven months after. So, Do you mind sharing some of the, uh, the follow-up strategies or, or the frequency just to give our, our listeners a, yeah. an idea of, of what that looks like? So I probably should have more of a written plan. I, I keep way too many mental notes. I know a lot of agents do that. Um, one of the biggest things I like to do is um, just like coffee cards and handwritten notes. If ever I have a correspondence with someone or I see them, um, I'll, I'll write some kind of handwritten note to start that dialogue um, with like a coffee card. Just say, just re- recall the conversation, let them know you listened to whatever it was they were saying at the time, reflect on what it was that you spoke about to an extent and just say, hey, I'm here if you ever need me as a resource or whatever it is, just make it genuine. I'll send out um, hammer and thank you cards and then I'll keep uh, like a rolling kind of top 25 to top 30 people that um, are either advocates of myself or are people that I would probably be, do, be doing business with in a period of time. And um, I'll do like quarterly gifts, like small things. Like we did Christmas wreaths um, at last holiday season. Um, just little things like that, like little gifts. Um, I should have a plan written out for it. I kind of just have this mental clock and I'm like, okay, now it's time to be doing this stuff and we kind of follow up that way. So. Well, you just really mentioned two big things that I, I just want to reiterate for our, for our listeners, because first of all, these are pre-clients. These aren't clients yet. And you're doing two things that 99% of agents, this is a guess, but it's probably true, uh, <laughs> don't do, which is to say the power of the handwritten note is, is number one. And it's just shocking uh, how few people who work in a consultant or a sales capacity, uh, a service capacity do not do that. I think about 
the different providers I have in, in different areas of my life that earn service fees for me. Uh, I never get a handwritten note. I met, maybe you get like um, sort of one at the holidays, which just, you know, or, or maybe it's even stamped with their signature, which again, I'm not complaining about, but um, the idea of a, you know, even a three sentence handwritten note is, uh, is a bit of a lost art. However, uh, the data uh, that from studies that have been done and, and even through modern, you know, modern time now still say that people desperately, you know, want handwritten notes and, and very few people do them. And, and the most successful agents I know pretty much all do them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I want to commend you, of course, for, for, it's like one of those things we all know we should be doing. Uh, but is, not is, everyone does it. Very few yeah. people. I, I tell this, you what's funny. I'm ahead. sorry to interrupt you. I, I no. actually got, I had a, um, my very first uh, Thanksgiving, I, I can't redo this now because of how much time I don't have now. I sure. actually hand wrote thank you cards to like almost 100 people. Oh, sorry, ha wow. hand, hand wrote Thanksgiving cards. Oh, wow. Almost 100 people that I knew. And Nobody does those, that. Nobody's no, doing all, that. Yeah, and it, it, it was crazy. And it, I mean, it took, it took a couple of days probably, but that turned into actually a client uh, that ended up being like $1.2 million between the listing and the buy side. So, so let, let's, let's just even say that took, let's say it took two minutes a card times a hundred. That's 200 minutes. You know, what is yeah. that? Like four, three, three, four hours. Yeah. That made you, and it, I mean, not, not that you're doing it for money, but if you actually look at the return yeah. on that investment you have to for, look at it, yeah. for, for a 1% return, right. And basically one, one of those people became like maybe more did, but at least one did. Um, that was the best stuff uh, four hours you ever spent. Yeah, it was about thirty-five thousand dollars in GCI for spending an hour writing a card. I mean, I, I don't know anyone that wouldn't write a card for two minutes to not <laughs> receive that kind of compensation if you just want to look at the money. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's the best ROI I've I've heard. I uh, <laughs> I, I really and and also I want to also mention the gifts too. And and this is something that again I don't know anyone's ever. A, a lot of people write personal notes who have been on our show because they're all top producers who know how important personal notes are. Um, but as far as sending gifts prior, um, I think that also is is going a step so far above and beyond what the average agent's going to do that uh, your these pre clients or, or call them for, you know future clients um, are certainly going to be impressed by. I imagine you get a tremendous response to that. Uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I really call I call those clients. It's just it's a warm list basically. It's a warm yeah. list of clients that you know that there's something there, and and I think the most important thing with it too is whatever you're giving out, it has to be relevant to the occasion as far as if it's seasonal and also it has to be genuine too, because if you're just sending out like kind of half effort things that don't bring value or aren't genuine, then then people see through that. So the things I send out, I, I'm genuinely, I do genuinely say this, I'm not just looking for um, a lead or a deal from it. I'm just seeing, okay, how can I somewhat selflessly provide something of value to someone else? Because people don't always remember what you say, but they remember them the way that you make them feel. And that's very, very important. Yes. Um, let's, uh, let, yeah, let's, let's talk more about that. So, so you, you, you know, started, you know, doing production last year. Uh, and, and then, you know, did you, did you see a tremendous, um, you know, it, sort of, uh, acceleration of, of your business from those activities you were doing in, in the first six or seven months? Yeah, the biggest month I had, actually my board behind me, uh, I compared 2019 to 2020. The biggest month I had when things really opened up, it started, it started in about May. And then the, the biggest month was July. So this is my first year. It was my first kind of full season. Uh, I had 3.63 million in closed properties in, and nine closings in July. Um, that's and that's probably when it, it was, yeah, it was kind of hard to believe because I, I went from, I mean, I went from driving Uber, being in minor depression because of my financial life situation to, you know, doing as much production in a month as most of the top 1% of agents in our entire market would do. So it was, it was very humbling. Yeah. I think July was kind of that poignant moment. So. And what, what, why do you think that is? Obviously you had a great mentor um, and, and you were, you were doing, uh, sounds like you were doing all the right activities. Was, was it just as simple as that? Or was there anything more to the, the secret sauce if there is one? <laughs> I think, I think there's the, definitely having the right activities from a real estate standpoint. So doing those hammering cards and, and kind of having that discipline. Um, but also I like, almost, because I was an athlete, I mean, I hate to refer to it all the time, but it's just what is my part of my identity for life. Um, even more so than the physical act of doing these things is having that mental fortitude and the positivity to just understand that like, even if you have a bad day, 
And in real estate, let's be honest, we probably have more bad days, I think, than we have good. It just yeah. happens that the good ones are that good that it overrides it. You have to just always kind of hold out for the good times. Don't allow, I mean, people always talk about energy and, and, and there's kind of that peak performance where you want to kind of ride on this curve. You never want to have the lows too low or the highs too high. And I think a lot of agents, from my experience in a short period of time, they allow their emotions to dictate the way they do stuff. You have to kind of have this positive affirmation, just try and stay on this even kill. If you go too low, it affects you, you go too high, it affects you too. So it's a mental side to it too, I think. Well, and you had to show up uh, to practice you know, when you were in college on days where you didn't have time to, to show up to practice or hit the weight room. You know, there's classes, there, there's a lot, or you just weren't uh, not feeling well. Or, or you, just, or... yeah, you just didn't want to. No, there's more. Yeah, that's, that's literally it. Now you say it, the more I think about it, the, there's times with football where I did not want to be out in the 100 degree weather running around, or I didn't want to do this, I didn't want to do that. But it's tough luck. I mean, that's what it takes to be a champion or to succeed. And that's the same with business. You have to show up when you don't want to sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's exactly it. And I, I was talking to my girlfriend before, uh, before chatting with you. And I said, um, you know, athletes always tend to do well in business or a lot of them do uh, simply because they already have that, that discipline and they understand that motivation is not really where it's at because if you're waiting around for motivation or inspiration to hit you, like, unless you're very, very lucky, it, it doesn't hit all that often, but discipline is something that you can, anyone can cultivate, you know, uh, on their own. Um, and that's yeah. what actually is going to get you the, probably the most results. And unless you're just really lucky and you get hit with inspiration at the right moment. But uh, if it's like me, it's just putting your head down, doing the work, keeping your blinders on and, and uh, doing the fundamentals uh, day after day. 100% no, it's, it's all about the discipline. And, and again, just to use kind of an experience I had that does drive me in business. Um, when I was at Boise State, I was there for five and a half years, um, redshirted my first year. I kept a list of all the guys that didn't make it from the beginning to the end. So guys that were on the team and yeah. either left and transferred or were kicked off the team for behavior, whatever it was, I just couldn't hack it. In that five year span, 86 guys were on the team with me that come and went. Wow. And a lot, of, so a lot of a lot of life is just outlasting people. I don't, I don't yeah. mean that in like in a morbid way. It's no, more to the more to the fact that uh, just showing up and doing the work is yeah. enough to out people a lot of people, and it's the same in business and in real estate too. I think. Yeah, my my mom has been a workout person forever, and I I used to ask her, how do you get up every morning and work out? And she goes, well, I, I have my shoes right by my bed and I just step into my shoes because she goes, if I think about it, I don't want to do it because nobody wants yep. to do it. She goes, yep, but no if time I think, to think. <laughs> yeah, she goes, just, just put on my shoes. And then she goes, as soon as I put on my shoes, I'm heading towards the car and I just make it. And I, and I said, oh, it's, she goes, because she goes, once I'm there, I'm going to do the work. But she goes, you know, if, if she goes, if I waited around to be inspired to go to the gym, she's like, I'd never go to the gym. Yeah. Um, yep. So, I don't think any of us would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, my my boss is great. Just before this this interview, um, every day uh, he's the owner of the company. He goes, uh, and I, if he was here, he'd pop his head in. Uh, but he's not here at the moment. But he goes, "Want to do some push ups?" And I go, "No, I never want to do push ups." But should I do push ups? Yes. And so yep. he just he just cranks them out. So uh, we just had a little push up session in the office. Yeah. But <laughs> but, uh, but but again. Um, the idea of, 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 you know, looking for motivation, you know, waiting for inspiration to hit is, is great and wonderful when it happens. But the good news is, you know, we can all control our habits while we can learn to cultivate our habits, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so, so thank you for, for, for that. Um, I, um, I, I just, just thought this was kind of a, uh, in, in a funny story uh, that I'd love to hear from you about. Um, you had a big listing. Anyway, I know you have a lot of big listings, but you had one. Uh, that had to do with, I think there was, uh, there was a dog that was, that was left and you had to sort of deal with that. Um, do you mind sharing that with our, yeah, I, I'll, I will, uh, I'll, I'll preface this with the fact that I'm a dog lover. I have a golden retriever <laughs> called Ruth who's nine months old. So I do love dogs. Um, yeah. but dogs aren't the most convenient thing to have running around an almost million dollar open house. So yeah, my, my client who, uh, who's a great guy. Awesome. Um, uh, sometimes can be scatterbrained. And uh, I, I guess he's used to leaving his dog when he, he leaves town a lot and travels, um, but he's used to leaving his dog on at the property and he has a neighbor that looks, that looks after her. Sure. And um, I, anyway, I'm getting ready to set up for this open house. And this is in a really prestigious subdivision in Eagle, which is the city about, just about 20 minutes uh, just west of Boise. So I'm getting ready to set up the open house. I, I stop putting the signs up. I go to open the front door. And this is a, this is a 6,000 square foot house. It's big. So it takes time to set up. So I'm getting in there, turning the lights on, open up a door. 
and the dog's in here and I'm like, hang on a second. Like the client, I thought the client's out of town and I call him up and I'm like, hey, um, you know the dog's here? And he said, yeah, I, I figured you could just do something with her. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> uh, I'm expecting a lot of guests for this open house. So I had to, anyway, long story short, poor dog. I had to put her in, yeah, anyone that has a, a, a big pool will understand they have like kind of like a pool room where you have the equipment for you sure. know, chlorination and everything. So I have to put the dog in the pool room and every 20 minutes go and check on her and give her a treat and let her out and keep her quiet so she doesn't disturb the guests. I mean, most people like dogs, but I don't think sure. you want the dog running around the house during that time. So yeah, yeah, that was a strange and somewhat funny experience, but she she's lived to tell the tale. So that's yeah, that's that that's that's funny. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of you know what you do for your clients. So so you just well actually before we get to that, I have a different question. So sorry, change gears just slightly. So you just were awarded this thirty under thirty um, by the National Association of Realtors. So only thirty brokers under that age at that, uh, you know, are, are get that award um, per year. Can you do, you, do you have any understanding of why they may have selected you? Why, why, uh, why they're, they're acknowledging where, what you're, where you're at in your career? So the three, the criteria that I remember, I had to fill out quite a lengthy application and answer a bunch of questions. And the, the three things they were looking for, if I remember correctly, were um, diversity, um, being a being a black English guy in Idaho might be somewhat diverse, I think. Sure. So I, I think that definitely helped. Uh, <laughs> uh, business business production to an extent. Um, there were some people in that did less business than me, some that did more, but that does play a bearing. And then um, kind of business innovation um, and roles in the community. Like, do you do philanthropic work or do you do charity work? That kind of stuff. And I believe I ticked most of those boxes. So I, I'm assuming that was quite a big driving factor. And I have a relatively unique story just in my background. And you know, hopefully that inspires some other people. So they kind of thought maybe I had a chance to be a, a role model of some extent to people. So, Do you mind talking a little bit about the role of philanthropy? And obviously you're doing it, I, I assume, for the, the, the organizations you support are because you're passionate about them. Have you found that business has naturally trickled in as a result? Obviously, again, understanding that is not your intention. Um, but have you found that that helps in business as well? You know what, I, I don't think that there's not very many metrics to track kind of charitable contributions to business necessarily. Um, and it, this sounds somewhat cheesy. But if you talk about good energy, I feel like if you do good things, yeah, it circles around like I, 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 find I have the weirdest circumstances sometimes where I'm, I'm, I do something that I guess it could be perceived as nice. And within a couple of hours, you get a referral call or text or yeah. something. And yeah. I, I, yeah, I can't necessarily say that what I've done charitably with those contributions has come back around unless it's just universal good energy. I really don't know. Um, I'd like to think of some instances, but I feel like if I was to come up with instances, people themselves may do charitable work for the wrong reason for those, you really yeah, have yeah. you have to, you have to really be selfless and be genuine in that find something that you care about and find people that you can support and if something comes around from it great if not the worst case scenario you feel great because you help someone else that needed help yeah and and that's really important is to to feed yourself um with with doing that sort of work if if you have the time and and the energy because what that will do is it will actually it's an investment you're making not so much in your business but just like working out, it's, it's an investment you make in your overall well-being. Um, and, and, you know, you're, you're working out for your physical health. Uh, you go out and, and give uh, as much as you can, and that'll feed your soul. Um, and that will just naturally, whether or not business comes your way, you're going to just have more uh, in the tank uh, to offer to, to business because you'll just be a more, more rounded person. So, um, yeah, thanks for, for that reminder. I, I actually just found out, I'm just going to throw this out there. My girl, I forgot the name of the organization, but right now, since uh, obviously most of the country is, is at home, um, there are a lot of seniors at senior centers that are very lonely, right? Maybe they don't have a lot of family or maybe their family isn't connected online as, as easily. And so you can actually now sort of adopt a senior uh, and, and do these Zoom meetings. Um, so uh, I thought that was kind of a neat thing that all of us could do. Um, and I'm going to sign up for that later. But just as an idea, my girlfriend was just telling me, I thought, thought I'd mention awesome. it. I, yeah, it's pretty cool. I, I never thought of it uh, doing that because the, the philanthropic work I'm involved in, um, I'm not able to do right now because of, of this. So, you know, there's ways to, to pivot. I want to talk yeah. to also about pivoting yourself. So now that, that things have changed, uh, at least hopefully just temporarily here in, in our country and, and the world, um, but also with your ability to do business, has your activity, as far as what you're doing on a daily basis, has it shifted or is it basically, hey, yeah, the world's changed, but I'm still kind of doing the same activities? 
my, my attitude hasn't changed as far as, you know, there's work to be done. Um, like I said, I still show up and do my thing. One thing that has changed, which is really interesting, um, and it's more efficient, is this Zoom thing has been great. So yeah. I've met with, um, I think, at least at least five clients in the last week um, and done f- and, and executed full buyer consultations, including paperwork, using Zoom. And it's been a great tool because instead of, the, instead of sitting down with someone and going through a paper line by line and trying to explain what it is they're signing, you can screen share and people are so more, um, you know, uh, responsive to technology. It's easier to go through and just say, okay, this is this, this is that, go through it um, and explain that way. And it cuts down on time because you don't have to, you know, I don't have to make sure the conference room is free. I don't have to have them travel to and from, and most people are okay with it. So yeah, I think for me, it's been more efficient. I'm busier than I've ever been. Um, don't know if that's me or if it's just circumstance it just happens, but yeah, it's been, it's been an adaptation, but it's worked out for the most part in my favor, I think. So. Well, and now the, the whole, or at least this country, um, we're all, everyone's on, on zoom or FaceTime or Google Hangouts or, you know, uh, you know, go to meeting. Um, and so now we're, we're having these meetings with our friends, our family, uh, business, and, and so it's just, it's now part of the zeitgeist. It's just part of America, cult, American culture, uh, sort of uh, tragically, you know, for, for reasons we would prefer it not to, to be, but it is where, this is where we are, we're at right now. And so I think a lot of businesses um, are going to find that these, these Zoom uh, meetings or the, these visual meetings um, are, are really going to be just the norm and, and will hopefully save everybody time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Time is money, especially in real estate. So if we can save time, then why not? <laughs> so, so you're somebody who's, you know, you're in your second year. Um, for anyone listening who's, who's within their first few years, uh, and we've shared, you've shared a lot of, 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 of techniques so, thus far, but is there anything specifically, you know, we talked about networking, we've talked about the importance of follow-up, uh, personal notes, gifts, um, is there anything else that, that you recommend you've seen, I'm sure even in several, you know, a few years, you've seen probably agents have success and agents not have success. Um, you, you were, your work with one of the top agents in the state as well. So are, are there any other tips, anything else that comes to mind that you think our, our listeners could benefit from? I think the number one thing is to educate yourself. So to be a sponge, um, never be too, never be too afraid to humble yourself to learn. Um, I'd like to think I'm quite well rounded in what I can do as an agent. Um, obviously I can help, I help people buy properties that are primary residences or sell them. And also the investment side of stuff has been really big for me recently too. Um, and that's not, that's something that I had to learn because I was never naturally a numbers guy. And I had to kind of learn about cap rates, learn about cash flow, learn about certain development processes. I think just being a sponge and learning as much as you can. Uh, you obviously there's a, there's a point where you overload yourself if you do too much. Um, but I, I have a, a, a good friend of mine now. He actually owns a, um, a, a gym equipment company and I had lunch with him a few months ago and I was talking to him. And he started smiling. And I was kind of like, is this, this is our first formal meeting. He says, why, why are you, why are you kind of smiling? I said, then why are you kind of smiling? He goes, I can tell us something different about you. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're like me, you're obsessed. I said, what do you mean? Like you're obsessed <laughs> with what you do. And I think there has to be some level, almost of obsession, especially in this yeah. business, because you, you have to learn so much to be a valuable tool to your clients if you don't have information that you can share and bring value to them, what makes you different from the next agent? That's what you have to ask yourself. Like, what is my skill set? What can I learn? If you can't do that, then, you know, anyone can be clerical and write a contract for someone or, you know, post a listing, but until you can provide information that helps your client make an informed decision, that doesn't, you're not any different, you know? So. You're right. And this idea of being able to provide value means you, you know, and, and the obsession part of it too, I want to, you know, I, I imagine, um, a lot of agents. So Elliot was just mentioning that he added uh, investment knowledge, investor knowledge into his his skill set, which again is not something that most realtors focus on. Uh, they work most realtors in, in the country focus with traditional buyers and sellers, not necessarily real estate investors. And then all of a sudden, an investor comes your way, and you go, you know, that's not really my specialty. And then you have to, you know, either try to get, hack your way through it or you refer it out. Um, whereas somebody who's really dedicated to this craft is, is, it has that obsession of like, I never want to not be able to, to help somebody by, because of my skill set not being strong enough. So I imagine was, was that the reason why you, you decided to add invest, investments in? Did someone find well, you or did you just know, Hey, I don't know enough about this. It's time to there, learn. There's a few instances that drove me to it. I think there was a couple that I had, I had one of my old friends in college was looking to buy an investment property out here 
yeah. he lives in Vegas now. He's looking to buy an investment property for uh, his sister to rent out with friends um, while she was going to Boise State. And then sure. he could obviously use that as, as, as kind of a, um, as a, an investment vehicle. So that was one of the things that prompted me to start understanding a little bit more. Um, and then two, obviously, personally, I've now started doing a little bit more of investment on my side in my second year, kind of understanding, okay, putting my money in certain, uh, in certain projects. And then I guess the, the third one, somewhat selfishly, if you can bring, if you can provide an investor who's truly interested in purchasing a property or a piece of land or whatever it is with tangible evidence that says this is a good investment, they're a lot more apt to purchase that than your regular traditional person buying a, a property off emotion motion because it's their primary residence. If you can show someone this is going to make them money or this is going to achieve the goal they want, how are they going to reasonably say no if they have the means to do it? And so, you know, from a selfish standpoint, those are some of the easier quote unquote deals you can do because you've done all the hard work for them. Yeah, you just got to show the numbers. Yeah, yeah you like it's, it's like being a golf caddy. You just help them pick out the club and they go and whack it. So there you go. <laughs> Well, that's the thing too, is, is a lot of realtors think, well, I don't know any investors. It's like, find the deal. The investors will find you. That's finding the mm -hmm. cash is easy right now. Cash is cheaper than it's ever been. It's so incredibly inexpensive to borrow. So the the investors are there. What they're looking for is you to bring them, bring them the opportunity. Yeah. yeah I think people look at it the wrong way. Exactly. They try and work backwards. Like, Let me find the investors and then find the opportunity. Don't get me wrong. You do have to do some networking to know who sure. it truly is in the game for an investment. Um, but you can't, you can't wait for it. The, the, I, I, one of the things I've kind of understood recently is real estate is just, it's basically people mating other people with opportunities, but the biggest piece that you have to create is the opportunity. So yeah, for sure. You hit the nail on the head with that one. You also do a lot of relocation. Uh, can you talk about that and, and, um, and sort of, you know, how that works? So yeah, Boise's, um, Boise, if you look at different, there's loads of different studies, but Boise is consistently one or two in um in growing housing markets um, and relocation in general uh, boise is a really um it's, it's an up-and-coming city it's been um, growing for several years now um, it's one of the least regulated states in the country which is very appealing to a lot of people that come from you know pretty more regulated states or you know different political things that i won't, that I won't get into but boise is kind of this haven um, outdoor lifestyle um, there's still city living great food great people it's got a strong economy as of right now at least um, so yeah, that's been, that's been uh, one of my increasing focuses just because you can buy a house in Boise. Um, the, the median sales price right now in Ada County, um, which is where Boise is, is situated is about $350,000. You got to LA, Seattle, these other places where people may have more wealth and money. Um, they're paying astronomically higher prices in comparison. So it's, it's seen as a, a, a landing spot for a lot of these bigger cities. Yeah, it's uh, it, it does always show up on on lists. Um, I uh, I need to, I've heard it's just so beautiful too. <laughs> I need to I'd like to go out there. It's actually I've driven through. I've, I've driven. I was a brand ambassador uh, for for a, a, a beer company many a million years ago, right out of college, and um, I traveled the country. Uh, I've driven through Idaho, but unfortunately not spent time in Idaho. So uh, I need. To, I need to go yeah. go somewhere because uh, I don't. I, it's technically checked off my list of visited states, except not really because I haven't done anything there. Just try for it. <laughs> yeah, so so I definitely want to come out and visit and uh, and see the city and see what what all the uh, how you know what all the hubbub's about because it's certainly it's just on that list of like cool cities like Asheville, Austin, Nashville, places like that. Uh, Charleston, you know, it sort of is in that same group of like cool cool cities. Um, if nothing, if nothing else, you want to come and see the blue turf. If nothing else, yes, yeah, for <laughs> sure, for sh absolutely, for sure. Yeah. Um, and and I also want to talk about you know look, the, being that you're in a hot, um, you know, uh, real estate town, um, there's also a lot of competition, right? There's lots of agents because, of course, real estate's so attractive right now in the growth. I imagine that spawned a lot more real estate agents. So what do you think it is that you do differently um, than, than other agents to help you know, grow your business? I think we touched on most of the points already, really, but just yeah. to reiterate, I think bringing value, um, finding opportunities for people, um, you know, that, and that can mean in a market that is this hot is finding properties for buyers off market, for example. Because sure. when things are on market, it's very hard to compete at certain price points. But yeah, I think really bringing information and value to help people make those decisions. And then the other one really is just work ethic. It, it sounds crazy, but I've heard so many stories from, from people purchasing and transacting real estate that aren't agents. Or my agent won't pick the phone up at this time, or they won't get back to me in this manner, or da 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 I, Unfortunately, um, you know, not naming names or bagging on anyone, I, I hear probably more 
bad stories about real estate agents and they hear good. So for me, I'm like, okay, what can I do to buck that trend? How can I be overly nice? How can I be overly dedicated to my clients? And sometimes, you know, you know, my wife will tell you this, I probably do more than I should reasonably. But I mean, as an athlete, that's what it takes to be great in my mind is you have to do more than you reasonably would expect them to do. So same, same kind of deal, I think. Wow. Well, I, what, what a great, what a great final, final statement, do more than what is reasonably expected of you. And, and you will have a more than reasonably expect a uh, reasonably nice life. You know, I think, uh, I think, I think that is, is, is a perfect place to, to wrap. Um, and I want to remind all of our listeners to, to do two things. One, I'd like you to, um, to visit Elliot's website, not just because it's his website and he's our guest and we want to promote it. It's actually a really nice looking clean website. So I'm impressed with the design and, and sort of uh, user experience of it. So follow, you can find him on Elliot Hoyt. That's E-L-L-I-O-T-H-O-I-T-E.com. And also please follow him on Instagram. He is a, uh, he, he's, he posts on Instagram. He, he, po- he has a very cool and interesting Instagram account. So everyone should follow. That's at Elliot underscore Hoyt, again, H-O-Y-T-E. Um, but Elliot, for anyone who's listening who might be wanting to work with you directly, be, you know, people in, in the area, uh, you're the, the Boise community or nearby you know, surrounding areas, what's the best way uh, to, for them to reach out to you? Uh, shoot, they can call me and text me if they want. Um... I'll give them my number, I guess. Sure. Um, so my, my work number is 208-340-8769. You can call me or text me. And then email is always good to do. And my email is uh, E-L-L-I-O-T at E-L-L-I-O-T, H-O-Y-T-E.com. That's Elliot, ElliotHoyt.com. And yeah, I just love connecting with people, even if they're not looking to necessarily transact real estate, or they're just looking for some business ideas. I'm a business-minded person, just opportunities to connect. I, I'm all ears and I'll lend five minutes of my time to anyone that reaches out to me. And if you're lonely and you just want a personal note, meet Elliot. He's going to write hey, you one. I will write you one and I'll send the Dutch Bros coffee card. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, uh, just as, as a funny aside, I, I, I think about this a lot because I'm a big fan of personal notes as well. And I think about how many I receive in a, in a year's time. Uh, and I would even say friends and will exclude, well, friends don't write, write me really, but let's say my family sends me, a, you know, birthday cards and whatever. If we're going to take all that out of it, just a legitimate handwritten note um, that has nothing to do with my birthday or, or a holiday. Uh, I'm going on zero. I get zero of those a year. Uh, if I get one, I'm like, oh my God, somebody thought to, to write me something. So this is one of those things that I know we're wrapping up, but boy, it could not be overstated. And you will be just about the only person doing that for that individual. Um, and, and that they will remember that. They, people are so impressed uh, that, that you take the time and the, and the consideration and care to crank that out. Um, so I couldn't, uh, obviously a lot of um, real estate training programs tout how effective it is as well. Certainly it's not a new idea, but it's actually a very old idea, but it should be, uh, should be done today. So, um, and Elliot, I know agrees cause he's the one doing it. Um, but on behalf of our listeners, we want to thank Elliot as well for, for his contribution today. Uh, also we, we are excited to chart your, uh, continue to, you know, watch your progress and success, uh, in the real estate community. Um, so Elliot, thank you, uh, for your time and today. And also, and, and Elliot is, Elliot is just as busy as ever along with pretty much everyone we interview such since, uh, our current situation has happened is he's busy. So he took the time out of his day, his busy day to do this. So we, we thank you, Elliot. Also our, our, actually to our listeners on behalf of Elliot and myself, we also want to thank you for continuing to support our show. Listen to episodes, two quick things, please tell a friend, think of one other realtor or real estate professional that, or sales professional in any capacity that might benefit from hearing from this interview and pass them, this over to them. You can also uh, visit us online, keepingitrealpod.com. All our episodes are up there and actually I'm in the process. Hopefully I'll get it done today, but by the time this comes out, it'll be done. We have a new website. Um, it'll be a lot easier to find things, but also second thing, tell, or follow us on Facebook. You can find us at facebook.com forward slash keeping a real pod. We post links to our episodes. We show the live video feeds uh, as we're recording in real time. And also we post an article every single day that we find helping realtors grow their business. Um, so Elliot, uh, thank you for, uh, for coming on the show. Um, and uh, congratulations on all your s- very, very, um, you know, young and impressive success. It's, it's just incredible. So keep Thanks for having, having me on, man. I'm, I'm just a product of, product of some good people that helped me on the way. So. Give it yeah. to them.
Yeah, no, that's it. I mean, that's the I, mentors and, and you, you've had obviously great coaches in your life, uh, probably on and off the field. So um, thank you for being a coach to our listeners. Uh, this is really, uh, really, really an awesome episode. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it.